Okay. Oh, we're back on. Uh, down. Is that good? Yeah. Good. Right. Okay. So, um, modeling in the age of agility. Uh, what we're going to do is again. I guess this is the second topic I'm going to address on a day that is focused primarily on agile approaches, um, in which I'm going to pick a topic that is normally seen as anathema and contradictory to what many people think of in terms of agile development. So um, I think it's mandatory, otherwise the Agile Alliance enforcement police come round and tell you off. If you try and if you go a whole day talking about agile development without using the manifesto, um, so there's the manifesto. Why am I just putting it up at this point? Well, there's a reason for this. Um, the point there is uh, three of these are actually related um, to what we're going to talk about. We've come to value individuals and interactions over process and tools. Yet, there is this curious contradiction when we look at what people often write about development process. Okay, so we're going to, somebody says we're going to do Scrum, we're going to do it this way. We're going to do XP, we're going to do it that way. Uh, we're going to follow a particular ritual for TDD and so on and so on. I'm not saying that it, none of these are a, a, is necessarily a good idea, but the way people then enforce it, they say, right, you must do it like this. Whoa, which bit of individuals and interactions over processes and tools was that? You end up, no, no, you're not following Scrum, you're not doing it right. Is there a contradiction, for example, in the role of the Scrum Master? I've always wondered that. I think it's a fascinating idea um, or a fascinating disqu uh, discussion. There's a question there to be answered. Um, but the, the process aspect, but also the tools generation, um, uh, one of the most visual and tangible outcomes of agile development has been the uh, profusion of tools, primarily open source, that has come out of it. Um, so there is a contradiction inherent in much of what we do, it doesn't, uh, uh, or to be precise, it, the value is still over here, but these are a means to an end, and now people are perhaps happy with the end. We need to understand that there are a couple of tools that are thinking tools. We also need to understand that there are a couple of forms of documentation that play a certain role, and there is the recognition of a plan is an understanding of something that we have a particular point in time. Um, why does this fit into modeling? Because modeling is often seen as being something that you don't do on agile projects because it is like a plan and you don't do plans. Because it is like a tool, because it involves a tool. In fact, normally people think that modeling is about sitting in front of some environment drawing pictures. Now, you can use various environments and some are very sophisticated in terms of modeling um, to do this, but that's not the same as modeling. Modeling is a far broader thing than this and they may or may not provide you with doc documentation. So the point to draw to the manifesto game is there is value in the items on the right. There is value. It doesn't say the stuff on the right is worthless. There is value. But these are a means to an end. Working software is one of the ends. Now, it turns out the modeling aspect is rather important. As human beings, we formalize, well, no, we come up with models. Some of them are formal, some of them are not, uh, all the time. We um, reason about the world. We try things out. We experiment. We form a mental model of how something works. Um, my mother has a mental model of a computer that is based on a typewriter. When I first tried to explain computers to her, that is actually the metaphor that I use. Her mental model. I sort of said, you see the TV? You see the keyboard? It's kind of like that, you know, brought together. Yeah, television screen plus keyboard, and there's some other stuff that goes on. And, you know, that's her mental model. To the point that even though she's been using, in theory, using these things for years, if she wants to correct something, and she knows she can't get the tip X and go on the screen, she backspaces. She's understood the power of delete, but she backspaces all the way to this thing. It's just like, oh, it's not good. But the mental model. Clearly, it's not whether this is a good mental model or not. It kind of allows her to do something, but it's not an effective mental model. On the other hand, my seven-year-old son, two years ago, I took him, to, uh, took him to the Science Museum in London. And we're walking around some exhibits, and I pointed to something. I said, Stefan, do you know what that is? And he looks at it. 
No, Daddy, what's that? It's a typewriter. What? Well, you know Daddy's computer and Daddy's printer? It's kind of like if you took away the computery bit and you connected the printer and it's kind of like all in one. Oh, okay. I see how that might work. Yeah. And uh, it's the m we build up these mental models. He we interpret one thing through another. And so most of the models we use are about things that already work that we've internalized and we try and interpret things um, in another way. I think actually on the, that one, there's something that somebody uh, passed on to me recently. It was a, was a, a classic tale. Nine or ten year old girl in an antique shop looking at an old dial phone. Okay, I see how you can dial numbers, Dad. But how do you text? <laughs> <laughs> so the point there is that the models throw us in particular directions. Sometimes they raise interesting questions. Sometimes they simply highlight anomalies. There is a mismatch. But we are always coming up with models, whether we like it or not. We have a model about how something works. I remember trying to teach somebody about uh, the, the whole notion of object references. I think it was a VB programmer. No, <laughs> he had the worst background, Fortran plus VB3. And he was just trying to teach this guy how to work with the idea of references. You know, you can point to a thing over there without actually having to have it. And he sort of said, oh, right, OK, I find that very confusing. I've always just thought of those things as being like taking a really big copy and passing it around. And then when you make a change to one copy, they all simultaneously change. It's like, in what way is that easier? <laughs> I do not understand that. So the point there is that sometimes our models hold us back, sometimes they enable us, but we are always making models. The models can be based on a metaphor, a, a play of language. They can be visual. They can be drawn. Sometimes the way that we draw can it's very strongly influence how people perceive a system. Um, they can be detailed. They can be high level iconic in this sense. Um, they can be approximate. They can be complete or incomplete. We have these different kinds of models to say that modeling is a very, very broad domain. It's not just one thing. Um, and we find that they are useful in certain domains. So we find, um, so let me make a distinction between uh, uh, two kinds of domains. Uh, we have given domains and there are design domains. Given domains, you don't get to change that. Physics describes things like that. Okay, that's a classic given domain, the real world. Um, we may also find that uh, we work, we normally work with design domains, and then there is a kind of a blurred area where there are, we move from given to design. So, for example, a business, to some degree, a business is a given domain, but to another degree, it's a design domain. It's a given domain in the sense that you may not be able to influence it. On the other hand, by the very act of design and developing software, you won't actually change it. So there's this kind of like uh, a range of things. And we use different things in each case. In the domain of software, we have a challenge, though, because um, the, we have not come up with a coherent story, if you like, on modeling. Um, you speak to different people, and they have different takes on it. So let's have an understanding of this. So we I the idea of the kinds of models that we can work with, well, Wikipedia gives us answers to many things. Some of them are even correct. Um, and the idea that we have a theoretical construct that represents physical, biological, social processes, set of variables, set of logical and quantitative relationships between them. They are constructed to enable reasoning within an idealized logical framework about these processes and are an important component of scientific theories. Idealized here means that the model may make explicit assumptions that are known to be false in some detail, but by the simplification of the model, allow the production of acceptably accurate solutions. This tells us pretty much everything we need to know. This is the essence of what we want from modeling. We would like to be able to reason about the things that we work with. It's one thing to, you know, somebody says, okay, tell me about this system. Well, yeah, it's half a million lines of code. Here's the first one. <laughs> I'm going to struggle to reason about that system. On the other hand, the code may be a commitment to detail. It captures also, it embraces a lot of accidental complexity. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of things that kind of maybe shouldn't be there, but we're not sure. There's a lot of uncertainty floating around with that. But that doesn't tell me what the problem domain is. Sometimes understanding the problem, being clear about what you are modeling. I speak to some people, and you, ask, you, you use the word model with them. They immediately assume UML diagram of the code. That's, that's their implicit assumption. They hear word model, they think UML and of the code. They do not think 
I wonder what kind of model you might be talking about. Are you talking about a financial model? Are you talking about a model in physics? Are you talking about a visual model? Are you talking about a model of problem or a model of solution? These are all different kinds of models. So the first thing, one of the first things we need to do is be very clear about what it is that we are asking a question of, what it is that we are trying to reason about, what it is we are trying to understand. Um, so the point here is that when we establish models, when we externalize them, when we make them shareable and communicate them with other people, they need to have a very clear point of view. This, uh, I can't emphasize this strongly enough. I've been given diagrams. People have drawn diagrams and you know, I've seen documents with diagrams and there's a diagram there and you're looking at it and it's like, okay, what does this, what does this show? It's a class diagram. Yeah, I can tell it's a class diagram. But what does it show? The system. Okay, right. Let's, are you trying to show, what question does this diagram answer? This is the most important thing. What are you trying to show me? This is, this is both the greatest strength and the greatest um, failure when it comes to dealing with modeling. A model should be able to adopt a point of view, to be able to answer a question, to enable a capability, to highlight something of importance. You need to be able to say what that is. What questions does this answer? This answers the question of the relationships in the domain between the customer's conceptual pieces of information, or this is a model of uh, the business information. This is a model of the business process. This is a model of whatever it is, you need to be very clear. In other words, it makes clear to me the things that I do are, are not clear or I would not otherwise know. Don't document trivia. I, I often find, uh, you know, I've seen documentation for things like collections libraries where you have box, line, thing, collection, line, star, object, and this is repeated on every bloody page. It's kind of, I think we can figure that one out. That's not interesting. You're not drawing my attention to something that is profound uh, or useful or that I might otherwise um, get wrong. So the idea is you, ne you need to have a point of view to be able to ask the question. So I did this exercise once with somebody. Um, this was a consultant who was... Uh, it was a challenge for the company I worked for. Um, I remember looking at his code and I said, you know, this, this code is, um, <laughs> this code passes all understanding and is beyond belief. I was trying to use very neutral language in my email because emails live forever. I said, he, you know, his, his, his code passes all understanding and is beyond belief. Um, uh, you know, and, and general recommendations of a, I would favor not employing him on a future project and stuff like that. Um, um, but I went, I, I asked him, because um, I was called in to help troubleshoot, and I had no idea what the system was. It was the other consultant that called me in. No idea what the system was. So I'm there, or I'm going to London. I'm on the train. It's, it's about an hour and a half on the train. I've got some documents. This documentation is useless. For a number of reasons, I still don't get what the system is trying to do. So I have a chat with this guy. What's the system do? And he tells me, oh, we've got this little parser thing, and then it parses language, and then this does that. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's what it kind of does in a mechanistic sense. But what is it for? Oh, right, uh, it's for taking things out of the database, and then it's got this little language and this little parser. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. And, but what is it actually... You know, after, about, after about 60 minutes or so of this, I gave up. I said, look, we are in a building that is an insurance company. I'm presuming your system has something to do with insurance. Yes, and they've got a database. And then we take the data out of it, and then we do the, whoa, 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 hang on. So sometimes we are unable to draw ourselves to that point of view to answer the simplest question. And without that, the model is ineffective. The diagrams he drew, the description he provided me with, the diagrams, that, everything about it, even the code he showed me didn't make sense because he was trying to frame it. I was asking a question about the problem domain, and he was drawn like it's kind of like an elastic thing, ping, back to the solution. He wanted to show me the code. That's lovely to show me the code. Actually, it wasn't. The code sucked. Um, I would have been much happier just with whiteboard conversation. Um, and so the point there is that he was unable to frame it in a way 
to understand the question that I was asking and then to use the model to answer it. He had no concept of this. As far as he was concerned, the problem description was two sentences long and that was it. Everything else was about the technology. So it, there is a, a, we need to understand that point of view is essential. And that when we take a model, we will, by definition, trade one point of view in for another. We will emphasize one angle at the expense of others. When we talk about the problem domain, we will de-emphasize the solution domain. When we talk about the solution domain, we want to couple it to the problem domain, but we will de-emphasize aspects of that. We do this not because we are being artificial or malicious or anything like that. We do this because it allows us as human beings to focus. Human beings have a very strong sense of focus. When we are in the flow and concentrating on something, we understand what we're doing. Take us away from that, we get a little bit lost. We are very good with focus. Interruption and diffusion and fragmentation we're not so good with. So we will necessarily leave something out. This is a, this is a, a key. The problem comes with what do you leave out? So sometimes people define, as we say, you know, mo a model is an abstraction. What is it that you're going to leave out? To abstract means to leave out. What is it we're going to leave out? And there are two ways in which models can fail in this sense. One is that we leave out the wrong stuff. Okay? Um, and uh, the other is uh, that uh, we take out the wrong stuff. Yeah? So in one sense, we leave too much in. So it's not clear what the focus of the model is. It's got distractions. In another sense, we take things out that are critical to the understanding and the message of the model. Um, so sometimes we pile things in accidentally because we are thinking from the wrong point of view. So one client of mine, and I mentioned this story to a couple of uh, folks last night uh, during the dinner, and uh, a few years ago they, they had this interesting example, a class diagram. And I'm going to pick on this client. It's, it's actually not unique. This is a very common failing. Um, they had this class diagram. There were 10 classes on it. And I'm looking at this thing. It's like, well, what's this all about? The thing that was suddenly obvious was that this was supposed to be a model of the problem, supposed to tell me about the domain in which they worked. Um, and then I looked at it. Out of 10 classes, only two of them made sense. The other eight looked like mechanisms, constructs, solution focus, that controllers and things like that. So I took away the eight and said, you've only got really these two classes. And the guy said, oh, yeah. I wondered if you'd notice. <laughs> what are you doing? He's just, <laughs> just throwing down obstacles, just see if he gets this one, yeah? see if he gets past that. I said, why did you put them in? He said, well, it looked a bit silly with just two classes. Well, yeah, you're right. It did look a bit silly. Um, but the point there is there's nothing wrong with that. But it's important to understand the background. The background in this particular case is that this person was, um, and still is indeed, a developer. Um, and although a team leader, they still have a development outlook on the world. Um, and you know, I'm just looking for a suitable prop here. And I don't seem to have a suitable prop. Ah, yes, I do. Good. It's all to do with point of view. Here is a pen. And I said, the reason that your diagram, your class diagram, does not look very interesting is because your domain does not look very interesting from that point of view. Your domain is all about workflow. Your information structure, you have plenty of information, but the re information relationships are actually frightfully dull. You want to be drawing an activity diagram or a state diagram. It turns out for this company, Activity diagrams and state diagrams were the most useful um, technique they had encountered for expressing what they were doing. It was all about business process. It was all about the state of things. They were doing logistics, so actually, yeah, state of things was very important. But for this particular system, it was as if I had given you a pen, but I'd shown you to you end on. If you look at it end on, it looks like a series of concentric circles. It doesn't look very pen-like. Its pen qualities don't really come out. But if I show this to you, side view, then its pen qualities become very, very important. You, or you can see them. Yeah? You need to choose the right projection for a given system. And uh, because, developers, because developers have this idea that code is really important, yes, code is important, but the code that we have is normally expressed in terms of classes. 
Now, if classes are all that you have, then all the other things, like state modeling, tend to disappear into the background. They become secondary things that you build with classes, but they don't become dominant features. There are a few languages that are state-driven, SDL, used in telecoms, for example. But the point about this is you need to choose the right projection for your model. What are the terms and conditions or the natural language that your domain would like to talk about? An example I sometimes use to emphasize this is traffic lights. Okay, traffic lights. Now, if, if you had to take what, if you were going to be left on an island with one UML diagram, okay, left on an island with one UML diagram, and I ask you, I want you to design a traffic light system, which UML diagram, because there are hundreds to choose from, literally, well, 15 I think it is, uh, but I, I, I lose count. First modeling notation I ever learned was uh, Warden Meller's uh, real time uh, no notation for Jordan. And that was five diagram types. I remember being confused by that. Five, when am I going to know how to apply the right one? And UML's 15. So, you know, this, this dwarfs it. So which of the 15 diagrams are you going to take to the island to model a traffic light system? Now, the point is, if you think about it, you wouldn't want to take a class diagram. What's a class diagram going to do? Well, we've modeled this red light really quite nicely. And, and here's the amber one, and, and here's the green one. Yeah, this is beautiful. It's a construct. Does it do anything? Yeah, you call the methods. And what do they do? Stuff. Magic. Yeah. Oh, no, that's an implementation detail. That's, that's the normal reply. Yeah? Got to watch out for those modelers. Implementation detail. Well, wait a minute. Hang on. This is actually the domain. The domain is not an implementation detail. Traffic lights have a well-defined set of behavior. And if you come to a crossroads, there are some really important rules you need to observe. For example, you don't go green in both directions. That's really important as an invariant. I'd like to be able to look at my model, model and reason about that. A model that allows green in both directions is a bad model. So, you don't take a class diagram to the island. You don't even take a sequence diagram. I'll tell you what, I'll draw out all the possible sequences of calls. I know of one company where they actually employed somebody to do sequence diagrams. I mean, that's just insane. The guy I spoke to who told me about this left that company. He just said, you knew it had gone mad when they started specializing people on diagram types. I mean, what do you, what do you have? People wandering around every day going like, you know, rustling up some business. You need any sequence diagrams drawn? The package, oh, sorry, the package diagram drawer came around before you. I've got him doing some stuff. You know, oh, this is insane. Um, but yeah, what you want to do is take to the island the state diagram. That's the most logical thing, a state chart. So you need to emphasize the right angle. You need to include the right things and exclude uh, the things that are no longer necessary. As developers, we are tempted to include more than we need. So let's look at a fairly classic example of modeling. Uh, London Underground is, um, this is, well, I was going to say, this is the London Underground. Of course it's not. <laughs> We're in Oslo. This isn't going to be the London Underground. L London is somewhere else. This is a representation of the London Underground system. And the original reason for this map uh, came about in the, the earliest form of it, I think it was in the 1930s, was because the London Underground network was growing um, quite a rate, that the actual geographically faithful map was becoming too confusing and unwieldy. And there were also, I've also discovered from uh, Steve Freeman, actually, uh, that there was another reason for doing this map. I'll come to that in a moment. But what is interesting about this map is that it is clearly defined with respect to purpose. The purpose of this map is not to be able to walk the streets of London or to figure out where the best properties are or to figure out where the nicest restaurants are or anything like that. These are not the purposes. This is not a road map or anything like that. This is a map that is used to guide you around the London Underground system. Its purpose is related to travel. You're at point A, you need to get to point B. It's all about that. And points A and B are well defined on the map. This is not a geographically faithful map. Uh, you can kind of tell that because the River Thames does not actually have 90 degree and 45 degree bends in it. <laughs> uh, Certainly not geographically faithful. Uh, I grew up, let me think, around there, just around there. And I can tell you that it's about 15 minutes walk from where I was to any one of these three stations. Yet it only takes you uh, about five minutes between some of these in the center. So it uses a, effectively a hyperbolic projection. This is the point that Steve Freeman made to me, is that, that actually for this sort of different there was a second agenda this map originally served when it was introduced. It was to make the suburbs of London look closer to the centre so people would feel more inclined to travel and people wouldn't feel as dislocated. Yeah, if you actually did this in a geographically faithful way, 
it, it, it would uh, uh, it, it makes it look a little bit too sparse, if you like. So this is a remarkably successful model. And clearly, uh, a point that um, Michael Jackson, now you have a choice of Michael Jackson's here. Uh, let's be very clear about which one I'm talking um, There, There is uh, Michael Jackson, the beer hunter, who sadly died in 2007. He was a great commentator of beer and whiskey. Uh, maybe that was one of the reasons he sadly died in 2007. Um, he was in, only in his 60s. Um, so a connoisseur of beer and whiskey. Um, there's uh, Michael Jackson, who was, uh, let's see, head of the British Army um, and the uh, head of the United Nations Kosovo Force in the 1990s. Um, there's Michael Jackson, the requirements and software um, uh, systems guy. And there's the other one. So I'm talking about number three. And number three focuses on, requ on requirements. And one of his best books um, goes by the incredibly dull title, of software requirements and specifications. And that's not exactly going to set your world on fire, but it's a brilliant book. Absolutely brilliant. If you find somebody else who knows about this book and ask them, and they all go, oh, brilliant book, one of the great understated books. Uh, there's a kind of little club of us every now and then you kind of bump into somebody at a conference. Yeah, I read that book. Wasn't it good? Yeah. I would wholeheartedly recommend this book, written in the mid-90s. And in it, he talks about requirements. He talks about specifications, he talks about models, he talks about everything, and he orders it alphabetically. I think there's 73 or 74 items in the book listed alphabetically. Um, each one is half a page to three and a half pages long, roughly. And he starts at the letter A, uh, under which he puts arboricide, which is the killing of trees, uh, talking about hierarchies and things like that. You know, watch out for accidental killing of trees. And he goes through and he talks about models in some detail. And he talks about this very clear point of view. You need to be very clear about, am I building a model of the problem or building a model of the solution? If you're building a model of the problem, to borrow a term from Eric Dernenberg from ThoughtWorks, he said this at QCon a couple of years ago, um, the model of the problem is already out there. So he was talking from an agile point of view, and he was saying the model of the problem is already effectively, it already exists. It's your job to unearth it. Yeah? Your customer has a model. If you're going to build software for your customer, you need to know what that model is. So this is an act of archaeology, if you like. Okay? So that model is already there. You can't say, oh, modeling, that's a waste. That's an overhead activity. Wait a minute. The model is out there. That's what you're supposed to be building. You need to, that's a learning exercise. In other cases, model of the solution is about a construct. It's a, it's a side effect of a design act, and we need to understand that. Now, in all of these cases, these models, and the point that Jackson makes, he says, look, with a model, you're going to get the case where there are things that are true of the model that are not true of the real world and that are not true of the software system. Okay, so there's this distinction. And we find it again here. We've talked about the scale. Let's talk about the colors. These are not actually lines. These are roots. Although we think of them as being physical, these are, this is a time-lapse photography, as it were, of a root. It indicates a root. It does not talk about physical lines. If you go down on the, go down to, let me think, uh, Farringdon. Yeah, I think Farringdon is probably a reasonable example. I think all three of those go through the same tracks, so the same physical lines. You don't look down at the track and say, oh, that's a pink one. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. Okay, this is a logical concept. So there are things that are true of this model that allow us to reason about it and communicate and use this overall system effectively. Now, this ostensibly looks very similar. Um, this is Munich, or rather, it's a representation of the underground system of Munich, and it follows very similar principles. Um, so we have all of this. Okay, now. The problem here is not, again, we have the projection issue. The uh, airport looks really close to the center, yeah? uh, whereas it takes, I think it takes a train about 10 to 15 minutes to go from here to here. It takes about 45 minutes to go this distance. Um, so yeah, all the same kind of concepts, again, slightly different stylization, same principle though. Right, now, let's see. So there is, uh, let's leave out the S barn lines. So here is where I was, running a workshop for a client. And as you can see, the only U-Bahn line that comes out of there is this one. Yeah, U5, you follow it around, it goes there and all the rest of it, yeah. So I need to get to this, to get to here, to get to here, to get my plane. Yeah, this is one of those simple games, you know, you play it with kids. Like, can you follow the line to, yeah. So I need to change once, here. 
So the workshop's finished. I'm talking to somebody. We get on the train that comes to the platform. I've been to this site many times. I'm you know, reasonably familiar with it. We get on the, we keep talking, we keep talking, we're having a good conversation. And then suddenly I realize I can't remember I'm at what station I'm at, except for the fact that it's the wrong station. It's as if the train had teleported from the tracks and arrived somewhere else. So I went, wait a minute, hang on, how can we be here? I first of all thought, I've missed a stop. And yeah, I had missed a stop, but actually it was, it was worse than that. I said, I can't be here, this isn't right. Because there's no, you know, this is not possible on this line. Remember, a model will define a world view. And if what you're trying to do is communicate to somebody, here's a world view that is useful and effective. Anything that lies outside that world view cannot be communicated and understood. And this guy said, oh, yes, yes, that's right. There is occasionally a train that runs from here all the way up to the uh, Olympic Stadium here. As you can see, you can't actually do that without changing lines. And he says, yeah, there's a direct train. But what line is that? Oh, it doesn't. It's the line without a number. It has the line without a name. How, what, how can you have that? So, I mean, this is Germany, okay? Germans are quite organized about stuff like this. And here is something that is outside the model completely. What do you mean the train has, doesn't have a line? It's the line that is not a line. I mean, what is this? Some kind of like Kafka-esque trip through Alice in Wonderland? I mean, this is insane. So yeah, it's a vestigial line. It's kind of like they used to have a line, but there's no longer. But sometimes they run it because they feel, oh, come on. <laughs> I almost missed my flight a result because it turns out that that very same week when I got back to here, they were skipping every second train because they had uh, works on the line. So then I worked out that I'm going to need to take a taxi. And they had three different sets of roadworks on the way to the airport. Uh, these days, with the security, you wouldn't get through. But I managed to get onto the, the, the flight just in time. Um, uh, it, it, yeah, not to be repeated. So in other words, this model is not effective because it actually misses an important piece of detail that was significant to me. I could not reason about it. So although it looks good, it's missing something important. We've left out something that should have been left in. Then we can contrast this with New York. Now, the great, there's a deep, deep irony here. New York has, in particular, yeah, New York has the simplest street plan of any world city. It all goes a bit funny around here, but you can leave that aside. They're making money down here, so that's all right. Yeah, they can have the streets any way they want. But the the point here is that this is a city that has the simplest street map of all. To the point that when my wife and I went on a honeymoon many years ago, we got a taxi driver for whom English was probably a fifth language. And I remember directing him back to our hotel. Yeah, I said, yeah, 35th, that comes after 34th. You know, stuff, I mean, we're pretty much at that level. So I was able to navigate, having not been to New York for many years. Um, but the point about this one is that this is a and my wife and I found it incredibly difficult to in some parts, particularly around here, to use this map because it was trying to, it's trying to do too much. It looks a mess because it is a mess. It's a rite of passage to know you're a real New Yorker when you can understand this. We're going to make it, it was hard to build, it's going to be hard to understand. And once you understand it, you're a real New Yorker. Yeah, that's, it's a kind of a rite of passage. You know, it's an entry um, uh, 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 criteria. And this is the challenge here, because this one is an insanely complex. I mean, there's stations down here where you, the train will miss every second station, but it's still the same color. They don't, they've not made a logical versus physical line separation. They've also shown you exactly everything so that people can tell exactly. I mean, how useful is it to know that you're at that point underneath the river? Yeah? This stuff is, is insanely complex. It's trying to do too much. They've left everything in to be helpful. Actually, they've also left everything in because people, again, from their point of view, they want to see something. Here's a, a greatly uh, simplified model um, that was uh, provided a number of years ago uh, that follows the standard kind of concept for these maps that are used in maps elsewhere in the world. And one of the reasons that New York has rejected it is actually you can't quite see it in the contrast, but um, Central Park comes out square, whereas it's rectangular. And people are not, that, this was unacceptable, you know. You can do anything else, but that's just not acceptable. So the point here is this has too much detail. It's too complex. It's too challenging for all of the wrong reasons. So when we are looking at our models, we need to understand, anchor ourselves 
what are we trying to do? If we are thinking agile, we are thinking we are being responsive, we are thinking that we need to focus on something. We want to focus. So I need to focus on something. What is the nature of the problem domain? What is the problem? It shouldn't really have lots of descriptions. This is one of the things I despair when I see tools that where I'm trying to model a problem and they show me a class diagram and they say your data is always private. They default to private data. If it's private, I can't see it. It doesn't exist. Remember that the object model that you are looking at is a conceptual model of the real world. It is not the same as a model of the code you are going to build. If it's a model of the code you are going to build, you want to keep your data fields private. You don't want to put gets and sets on everything. You want to follow particular conventions that are related to the language. You may also find it's not useful to enumerate everything. That's, again, one of those too much detail things. If it is a model of the problem, there's no such thing as private data, because if it's private, you can't see it and it doesn't exist. All data that you can access in your problem domain is by definition public, but it doesn't mean it's a field, and it's probably not an int either. Yeah, this is the other thing where people, where computer types start uh, going into modeling a, a system. So, uh, you know, I've, I've um, first case tool I ever used uh, was for um, uh, was uh, uh, was on a Windows system, a long, long time ago. And there you are with an analysis diagram, and uh, you pull down the types, and it gives you these fundamental uh, C types, including character pointers, like the character pointers in the real world. Oh, I, I'm pointing at you. That, he's a character, so you know. No, that's not what we mean. And then people think, oh, it's better now, we have strings. No, no, no. There are two groups of people in the world who talk about strings. People who do computing and linguists. To everybody else, a string is not something in your business model. A string is something you keep in a drawer in the kitchen. Yeah? That's what other people think. They call it text. They have other words. Yeah? We strange computer people worry about, you know, that inch, should it be 2 to the 32, 32-bit you know, or 64-bit? No, this is nonsense. People talk about numbers. They have a completely different concept and language for doing this. And a failure to differentiate the idea that in the real world uh, somebody's name is a piece of text that is constrained in some way versus it's a varchar, it's a string, it's a character array. These are two very different ways of describing something. We need to be very clear about that. Um, so figure out where you're drawing your model from. Yeah, where you, are you trying to show somebody what you're building or are you trying to draw a conceptual model? Um, as I said, you know, real world, there's my eyes. My eyes are brown. That's not public data. That just is. That's an attribute. It's not like I've revealed any kind of private implementation by doing that. It's not an RGB value. Okay? Uh, so th the notion there is that we need to be a little more faithful. Once I start representing this in a software system, I start making decisions. Now, some of those may or may not make their way into another model, but we need to be very careful about this. Other reasons we do this. Um, you may provide a language, a, a working metaphor, if you like, for the system. You may be drawing on the problem domain. Part of the challenge is to actually understand what is it that we are building. What is the language of the domain? I'm always fascinated. So this is very much related to domain-driven design and, indeed, the original goal of modeling uh, in many cases. I find sometimes people forget this. And I'm always fascinated when I run workshops where people will quite happily have a, a, a understand what the customer wants, see the other writing, or if it's a, if it's a, a closed workshop for a, a dummy example, I will give people a problem, and they'll sit there and they'll use they'll 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 understand this, and then they suddenly they start using different vocabulary. So if I'm talking about a plane, I might say, well, people have passenger planes have passengers, yeah, and you book onto flights. Before I know it, they've ignored the word passenger and are suddenly talking about customers or users. It's like, wait a minute, customers and users, that's not in the domain model. Or rather, a user might be, one of, might be another thing. The language of the domain should be carried through as much as possible. You may choose to illustrate a solution approach, but make it clear to the reader that that's what they're going to get. You may use a model to illustrate an existing solution. So in other words, here's something we've already built as opposed to something we're going to build. So if you're not clear about the purpose, that's a problem. Adding models that are not needed. In other words, you draw somebody's attention to something that is not necessary. It's trivial. Um, one of the most depressing uh, review experiences from a team I would definitely describe as not agile at all um, was sitting, reading a 300-page document. These guys did, weren't big on working software. And they weren't big on working, actually, either. Um, 
because we <laughs> realized that they copy and pasted much of the stuff we had written into their document. It's like, wait a minute, I think there's a copyright on that. You can't just do that. Um, and they, they ended up documenting every single piece of trivia. So for a class that has no interesting object life cycle, they would draw a state diagram. And the state diagram of a class whose objects are either immutable or doesn't have a very interesting life cycle is along the lines of created, used, discarded. And you, after you've seen that a few times, you get bored. Yeah? This is trivia. This is just not worth documenting. And much of this document was, was taken with that. And what happens is you start flicking past. This is the notion that if you, when people say, oh yes, but we're documenting all the detail. Humans do not want to see all of the detail. Humans are really bad with all the detail. If you want to make sure that somebody does not understand something, what you do is you give them all of the detail. You are guaranteed that they will understand less than if you gave them no detail at all. Because at least with no detail, they have no preconceptions. Yeah, they have a blank mind upon which you can put anything. But once you give them all the detail, they block it out. Yeah, it's like mental spam. So this is the problem. If you, uh, and it, took, it, it took me years to learn this, and I think uh, it, it's, a, it's a message worth passing on. That if you really want to communicate something, you say, look, this is the most important thing about what these guys are building, then the way to make it seem really important is to leave other stuff out. It accentuates the importance there. Okay, you've got to leave the right stuff out, but by leaving stuff out, it will actually carry the message more strongly. The signal-to-noise ratio will be better. And these guys just flooded the whole thing with models that were not needed. And so we have all of these cases. So uh, let me give you an example. Um, somebody sent me uh, a model about four years ago of some C++ code that they were going to add into a network, uh, sorry, a framework, uh, the ACE framework um, up here. Now, uh, they, this was their adapt adaptation layer, and then you plug in here. Okay, it's not unreasonable as a framework approach. The problem we have, though, is that, I mean, okay, good stuff. Let's pick on the good stuff. It's always um, something that's worth picking on. The good stuff, uh, use of color. In fact, it's actually good for two reasons. As somebody who's colorblind, I can, this is, these are good colors. Um, so you have this kind of structure. That's the good stuff. You can tell the layering by the color. The problem, though, is, well, let's put it this way. Why are the boxes not the same size as each other? Why are they not similarly proportioned? Why do they vary so much? Why does this kind of, if you blink at it, look like it almost could be hanging up in a museum of modern art? I mean, I said in the previous talk that aesthetics matter, but this wasn't what I was talking about. Why, why are the boxes a different shape? What's going on here? The text. All right. So what's the text say? The almost unreadable text. The almost unreadable text is giving you signature detail of the methods. How important is that to understand what, what's the purpose of this model? Well, the model doesn't have a purpose. It's, or rather, <laughs> here is the purpose. It's to show you a class diagram of the framework. That's not a problem. Sometimes I get this with people. It's like, what problem are you trying to show me? What does this model illustrate? Oh, this model illustrates a class diagram. No, no, this model is a class diagram. What are you trying to show me? Classes. <laughs> You've succeeded, but what message? What story? What is the point you're trying to make? What you want to show in a model is something that you could not otherwise see. This is a model of code. This is a model of the code of the framework. So this is a model of something that exists. Now, if I want to see that code, I can see that. In fact, you know, that's not, that's not hard. I can go and see the code. That's not a problem. So in other words, you don't simply want to repeat the obvious bits in the code. If I want signature level detail, the code is actually the best way of defining the signature level detail that you've got. What is not obvious in the code is the relationships. Oh, yeah, it's all there. You know, you sit there and you can trace through inheritance hierarchies and you can go and look at the fields and the, the arguments and say, oh, this depends on that. But it's a secondary detail. When you write code, the class is emphasized, signatures are emphasized, relationships are de-emphasized. They come low in the running order. But one of the things that makes a system a system that characterizes an architecture is the nature of the relationships. 
So therefore, you want to promote these and visualize them. Say, look, see the relationship. See how that package depends on that package, but this package does not depend on that package. Or this is the extension to that. You want to emphasize the relationship. Show me something I can't see in code. At code, I'm looking like this. I need to be able to see back as well. I want both points of view. So you don't be satisfied with just one point of view. Two points of view. The problem here is that the author of this has tried to mix both points of view into one place, and it's a mess. Because now it's not particularly good at representing signatures, and it's not very good at showing relationships, because it's made the relationships completely secondary. Look, they've been pushed out of the way. We have a situation here where the tail is wagging the dog. Because this happens to have a long method, it's distorted that, which has changed the whole shape of the diagram. So now the large scale thing is based on completely accidental qualities of naming convention and argument listing. But the one thing it could be showing and should be showing is the nature of the relationships. It's difficult to reason about these relationships when they're drawn like that. It calls to mind the quote of Tony Hoare, that either you make a design that is so simple that it is obviously correct, or you make it so complex that it is not obviously incorrect. If you redraw this, you discover that some of those relationships are redundant and wrong. But you can't tell that from here. So be clear. You need to answer a question. You want to be making a point. I want you to look at this. If I keep bombarding you with diagrams, you're going to glaze over. So I want to use up your, I want, I'm going to use your time as a resource. I want to be able to get that time and get you to notice something. So I'm going to be very careful about what I draw. Now, if it's drawing to communicate to you in paper form, that's one thing. But alternatively, we, I'll, I'll talk about the collaborative aspect in a moment. Um, this idea of establishing what point we want to make and establishing what questions are interesting is another one. So the other aspect is once you're satisfied with models, don't think that is the goal of the software development. Um, sometimes people use models as a substitute for developing software. Okay, so we've spent a lot of time, we've developed models, we've developed models. We are on schedule. Yeah, if you have a standard waterfall life cycle, you are on schedule. You can always deliver documentation on time if you need to. There are various techniques for doing so. Some of them are slightly cynical. But if you gave me a deadline, I don't know, I don't know what your system is, but if you gave me a deadline on Monday, I bet I could deliver some doc documentation. Yeah, I might have to copy and paste some Latin from the web, but you know, I'm I bet I could deliver some documentation. I put the Latin in the middle because you never read the middle. Yeah. So the point there is I could deliver something that was approximately plausible, but I don't commit to detail. The challenge of software is we commit to detail. We commit to accuracy and precision. So um, the notion here is we need to be, be very clear that the purpose of these models um, is very much that they are technical consumables. Unless your goal, unless you actually have it as an objective, that this is a deliverable, and I do question whether or not models are deliverables. I know one company where they did actually have this model, and this is absolutely bizarre. Um, the, um, this company, well, it's not a company, actually. It was a, it's a, a, an emergency service. And this emergency service, they didn't have enough resources to develop the software, so they outsourced that. Okay, that's not, a, not an unheard of model. Um, so they outsourced it. But what they did, and I remember they described this, and kind of my eyebrows kind of separated on my forehead. It's just like, what? They outsourced the analysis. Let's use another word. An analysis is an overused term. Let's use another word, a set of words that's more meaningful. They uh, outsourced the understanding of what you wish to build to one company. And then they outsourced the, and now you're going to build it, to another company. So these guys have a good understanding of how you're going to build it. And then what, what are they, how are they going to commute this understanding? To a piece of paper. You know, there's only one thing that is more lossy than a piece of paper for communicating knowledge. And that's telling my three-year-old something. Yeah? I, I get the most strange requests. Mummy says, does she? Are you sure she says that? And I'll come out. Yannick says... No, that's not what I said at all. You end up, uh, you, you, tell, you, you tell him something and it will get miscommunicated um, in the strangest ways. Go and tell mummy this. And then my wife's in a really bad mood when I see her. It's like, what? Oh, he said that, <laughs> he said that you were too busy and you were working. It's like, no, I said I'd be coming in two minutes. 
or what do you want or something like that. No, it just, so, so apart from my younger son, paper is the only other way of guaranteeing that you will not fully communicate something. That is not, the, that is not to say that a written form of communication is not ineffective. As somebody who writes articles and writes books, I believe we can write effectively, but that it takes care and attention to do so, and you need to consider more perspectives, and you need to back it up with something else, a visual form, um, a, a verbal form, uh, conversation, and so on. These paint a richer picture. So the point here is that you don't really want to be thinking in terms of technical, uh, uh, that these are actually deliverables. These are technical consumables. These are for the consumption of the people who care about the software development. Um, they do not have business value. In this sense, they could be considered overhead. They don't actually have this uh, kind of notion of value that people uh, want to pursue. But not everything in software development is just about generating value. We may have an end game where value is generated, but the idea is in order to get to that end game, we have to put steps into place. And a sufficient approach to modeling, rather than excessive approach to modeling, is one of the things you want to focus on. In order to build, before I commit myself to creating a complex software system, do I understand what is required? Do I understand the nature of it? Do I understand the nature of how we're going to build it? I may find that I need to express that some way. So the most, so having established that it's a form of communication, the next most important thing is actually why this talk is called modeling in the age of agility and not models in the age of agility. This is about collaboration. And collaboration, it's about the people thing. It's the individuals and interactions. There is, there is no benefit to having a model of it. It's just a private secret for somebody. I used it on my machine. I came up with it on my machine. It's on my machine. You don't want to divide up the work and say, right, you five people go and work on five different corners of the model. Do that. Oh, yes, but we have a review process. What do you do for your review process? We email each other things, and then we ignore each other's email for a few weeks, and then we get back with superficial comments because we spent five minutes looking at that. Maybe if you put the model on Facebook, we'd spend more time looking at it. But the point there is that these are, these are passed by. They're not actively involved. With one group, um, we remodeled the problem domain of their system. Having the analysts had spent weeks on this, we basically remodeled it in a matter of hours by doing something really wild and crazy. We all stood in the same room together with bits of card and whiteboards and pens and coffee. You've got to, you've got to remember that one, otherwise it doesn't work. You get lots of sleepy business analysts and developers. Yeah? You do that, you create a situation in which people are communicating. The models become a, a place through which you communicate. They become a means of communication. They become a byproduct of communication. They do not become the goal of communication. The goal of communication is to understand. And we're, we're using these, and these are going to be thrown out. Maybe you can throw them away if you want. Alternatively, you can capture them in some form. But the key thing there is the ing in modeling. It's the doing of it. It's the process. So therefore, one of the things you lose is that uh, when you separate people is exactly that whole benefit of putting people together. Um, so with one group, there was a, a, I did a, a health check with uh, one company. And they, it was quite bizarre. They had a, a business analyst had sat there and come up with some models with one of the guys. Nobody else in the team knew that they had had this meeting. And it established the requirements at some level. And then I think one of them went off on holiday, and the other one was ill, and then they had to start developing. But nobody knew that there had actually been discussion about the modeling. And so this model was useless. The wa it was waste. It was pure waste, because nobody knew of it. And they started just developing in that good old-fashioned way the developers do. All right, let's start writing some code. What technology are we going to use? I don't know. What about that? Yeah, let's do that one. Let's start with a blank page and then fill it up with stuff instead of being able to say, ah, oh, we have a shared knowledge. Because when you bring people to the table, and I'm, I'm often surprised by when people sort of say, you know, you know, we've got our UI designer. We normally include him in the project about a third of the way through. And uh, the developers, you know, a little bit after that. So wait a minute, why didn't you get them at the beginning? Well, because they're not business experts. Well, there's a reason they're not business experts, because they're not given the chance to participate. But they ask questions from different points of view. Because the tester, system tester, will be sitting there thinking, like, how am I going to test that? What does that actually mean? 
when you say that the system shall do this, what do you actually mean? What could I examine in that case? When a developer looks at that and they're thinking, wait a minute, I know how I'd write the code for that, but against the old system, that would look like this. So I'm not sure what that means in practice. So they generate a question from that point of view. The user interface designer is sitting there going, like, well, wait a minute, how would you use that? I've got, they're, they're mentally creating candidate models for how, uh, and candidate screens in their mind about how they go about something. And they use that to ask questions. So this is a multiple point of view. It's the interaction. If you take that away, you're not going to get that through email. So the thing, obviously, we have to be very, very careful about is, is falling in love with our diagrams. That You do sometimes get that as uh, this notion. Um, beautiful drawings can become ends in themselves. Often, if the drawing deceives, it is not only the viewer who is enchanted, but also the maker. Alberti understood this danger and pointed out that architects should not try to imitate painters and produce lifelike drawings. The purpose of architectural drawings, according to him, was merely to illustrate the relationship of the various parts. That's the key. Alberti understood, as many architects of today do not, that the rules of drawing and the rules of building are not one and the same. And the mastery of the former does not ensure success of the latter. This is exactly the way it is with software. But I will, have, I will say, I'm going to emphasize here, it's not a division of labor thing. Effective modeling takes skill. You're listening for ambiguities. You're listening for vocabulary. You're trying to tease out relationships. Um, one person after a workshop we ran at this company, he complained to me. He said, we spent lots of hours arguing and disagreeing. I could have just written a model in less time than that. As far as he was concerned, it was like the number of boxes you draw per minute is the most important thing. But I said that's the whole point, is it was to generate the discussion. I mean, it didn't, it didn't end up in you know, violent argument. But I said the whole point there is to generate this discussion, because you're going to have it sometime. The question is, do we do it earlier and take a few hours, or do we have it taking a few weeks spread over months after hard effort on one person's part? Well, that person will feel the need to defend the code or whatever it is that they've committed to, because they put a lot of effort into that. And now you're saying that's not right? They're going to defend that. So better to have this discussion now. And this whole point of view, this just person was sort of saying, oh, no, no, the purpose is to create these diagrams. But I will say drawing takes skill. Drawing does take skill. The misunderstanding about how to draw things. I find that most people, even given a simple notation like UML, well, simple structural notation in terms of its form, rectangles and lines, even given that, a lot of people are unable to make effective drawings. They don't know how to draw. Most people, the last time they were taught to draw was at school when they were maybe 13 or 14. And there is a way of presenting stuff that takes advantage of how people will read a page and will draw their attention to it. Most people draw the worst class diagrams. The relationships aren't wrong, but they are just done in a way that does not um, uh, work from a visual perspective. Indeed, the designers of UML also suffer this. There are loads of things in UML that are actually wrong uh, and back to front in terms of their emphasis. But that's a separate, separate uh, kind of discussion. In fact, let's just talk briefly about notations, because that's where we're going to end. So the time has come, the guru said, to talk of many things, of use and cases and object models, of processes and strings, and why notations unify. And if we need such things, do we? Well, let's understand that when we talk about um, notation, UML is not the only game in town. But UML has the advantage of being, well, it's not universal. U is unified. But it is a lingua franca. Like any lingua franca, like English, for example, it means that it's big, it's messy, it's inconsistent, and it's borrowed from absolutely everywhere. And its main power is that it is agreed upon by different groups in order to use it. So UML is actually relatively clumsy in some cases, and it doesn't really represent everything we'd like to. Um, but it does at least have presence. Sometimes it makes sense to step outside. If you want to talk about UI design, UML is not particularly helpful there. If you want to talk about component structure, again, UML is not as helpful as it could be. It's got visual obstacles to the use of the notation. If I want to talk about packaging, and then I want to talk about other structures and how my packages relate to my class hierarchies, it turns out that UML can combine some of these well, but not others. So UML is very good for some things, but not others. It may make sense to step outside and to use some other ad hoc notation, your favorite whiteboard notation. But you don't want to end up in the situation that sometimes I've seen uh, people end up in, which is where UML came in, which is to the ha protocol handshake problem. You go to a whiteboard, you draw up a rectangle. Somebody says, what's that represent? Class. Oh, no, my classes are elliptical. Oh, OK. 
oh, my arrows go the other way. Oh, great. So we've got a protocol handshake. We, end up, we, we, so we sit there, basically creating a dictionary for each other, and then we go ahead. And then we discover we've got, each got concepts we can't express for the other ones, or things we'd never thought about. Yeah? Things that we cannot express in the other person's frame of interest. Um, and I think that notion of expressing uh, range of interest is very important. Um, don't, sometimes there are certain notations it makes sense to bend. But if you're using UML, feel free to bend the package notation a bit, for example. But don't really bend things like the state chart notation, because something like the state chart notation has very well understood formal semantics. Don't mess with that. It's well understood. If you start messing with it, it becomes misunderstood. So there are some things you can bend and some things you can't. Bend is a term that uh, Martin Fowler uses in UML, but still, it's quite a useful one. And remember who's in charge. Don't be a slave for that. So there's this careful balance. You know, UML's not perfect. In fact, it's deeply imperfect. But it is a practical starting point. Um, but again, feature modeling, there's something called feature modeling, doesn't fit into it. So be very, very careful. There is a balance here in terms of drawing on the right things and being relatively um, reasoned about it. So most of this hinges on the idea that if you are looking to employ, if you are looking to understand what it is that you are building, why you are building it, the way in which you are building it, you need more than just code and a few index cards. You need a context around these that you can create and uh, fill. We implicitly model as human beings. And what we're trying to do here is harness that in order to create working software. It's not a substitute for working software, although sometimes, pe as I say, people use it as a proxy. It is a way of getting there. It is a way of answering questions and making points. OK, so I hope that has been of some use. Um, the next talk that this probably relates to is actually probably the next one, actually. Um, yeah, probably the next one and the last one in the day. The next one's going to be the uncertainty principle. And uh, oh, we'll take a slightly different direction that kind of unifies the previous two talks. I hope that's been useful. As I say, I'm around all day. Um, I have no choice. I'm chained to this uh, desk. Um, so I'm very easy to find. Um, thank you for your time.